Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's much better. So uh, as early as it is for many of you, uh, I flew in from Seattle, so it is really, really early for me. And so uh, we are so lucky here uh, to have been invited. And I'm so pleased that, that this group, uh, these panelists, uh, accepted the inv invitation to speak with you uh, today and uh, so excited uh, to, to learn from each of them. And so uh, you already have the introduction. Uh, we're going to go on to question number one. We've been given 75 minutes to figure out all of the problems in society. So uh, we'll, we'll, there will be a quiz afterwards. So uh, we have question number one, uh, which is how have different groups faced and continue to face different challenges barriers in their struggle to achieve access to justice. And we're gonna start with uh, Dean Warner. Thank you, Bob. Bushu Anishinaabe, hello friends. My name's Elizabeth Cronk Warner. My pronouns are she and hers. And as I like to do any time that we gather together, I do want to acknowledge that today we're on the traditional homelands and territories of the Seminole Nation, as well as the Calusa and Tacoba uh, traditional tribes. Um, I also want to thank Bob for the invitation to join this esteemed panel and to have this wonderful conversation today. So uh, my duty here today is to talk a little bit about uh, Indian country and the intersection with the legal system. So I'm a citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, and I've also served as a judge for two tribes, as a district judge for the Prairie Band Potawatomi tribe located within Kansas, and then as chief appellate judge for my own tribe, the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. And so it's with that background that I approach my five minutes, and we've been very clear that we have limited time. Um, so the first is, and, and I, I will dive into criminal law a little bit later on the panel, so I'm not gonna talk about there, but I wanna talk about historical developments that continue to impact tribes and individual Indians today. So first is Johnson v. McIntosh. Um, Johnson v. McIntosh is a case that a lot of law students read in property, and basically what happened there is you have a Scottish immigrant who came to the United States and was given a piece of land that had already been sold to um, a non-native from the tribe, and so the question was, who got to give uh, this land away? Was it the tribe as the owner of the land? Or was it the federal government as the owner of the land who recruited the Scottish immigrant to the United States? And this is really important even today, even though it's an 1823 case, this is alive and well today, because what the US Supreme Court held is that tribes do not own their land. The federal government owns land in trust for the use and benefit of tribes and individual Indians. And the reason why this is still very much uh, relevant today is because sources of income and wealth development that may be accessible to you or I who own our property individually are not available to tribes or individual Indians. And so this has had a pervasive, a pervasive effect of poverty um, throughout the generations. Similarly, in the late 19th century, the federal government engaged in a process of allotment. Um, so this is also where homesteading came from. So the federal government opened up about two thirds of Indian land within the United States to individuals who were not native after having given away plots of land to individual Indians. So it's estimated that Indian country lost between two thirds and upwards of 80% of its land through those allotment acts. Again, um, causing this system of poverty within Indian country. Um, so they've had huge losses of lands and then many of us can't own tribal territory. So for example, I wanted to be close to my reservation, can't own land on the reservation, so I have property very close to the reservation. Um, there's also a continued history of forced assimilation um, and that has had very traumatic effects. So hopefully you've recently seen stories about the boarding schools, both here in the United States and in Canada. The theory was you kill the Indian to save the man, Colonel Platt, Pratt famously said that. And so Indian children were ripped away from their homes and were put into these non-Indian facilities where their language, their culture, their traditions were taken away from them. And they weren't given necessarily an education along the lines of what you or I might think of as an education, Rather, they were taught manual skills. Um, that 
uh, type of assimilation policy has not gone away. Um, many folks argue that assimilation is still alive and well today, and it's happening through adoptions. So many Indian children prior to 1978 were taken away from their homes. It's estimated between 25 and 30 percent of Native children across the country were taken away from their homes before 1978. And I say 1978 because that was the year that the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed. And of those 25 to 30 percent of, of children who were taken away, 80 percent of them were put into non-Native homes, even though Native homes and kinship relationship homes were available to them. This has resulted in his significant historical and lived trauma um, for many of our indigenous peoples and tribes within the United States. You couple that with the fact of, hopefully you've heard about missing, murdered, and indigenous women. Um, so in 2021, over 5,000 Native women went missing and murdered. This is 2.5% the rate of the, of the general population. Additionally, it's estimated that upwards of 50% of Native women are sexually assaulted. So these are just some of the statistics and the historical developments. Um, I am over my five minutes, so I will pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you, Dean Warner. Uh, Justice Troy Weber. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So actually, arguably, I would say that uh, individuals of color uh, specifically uh, blacks, have greater access or have, or have had greater access to uh, the courts because blacks have been disproportionately stopped, disproportionately <laughs> arrested, uh, disproportionately uh, tried, disproportionately convicted, and disproportionately incarcerated. So we've had greater access <laughs> to the courts and, and to the system. And so what we try to do is to perhaps lessen uh, that type of access and have greater access in terms of what's going on in the courts. So I, uh, as stated, and I am an associate justice in the appellate division in, in New York State. We have our court of appeals, we're weird. The court of appeals is our highest court. Uh, the Supreme Court is a trial court. And then we have an intermediary um, appellate court, and I sit on that court. But I wear another hat. I also sit as co-chair of what's called the Franklin H. Williams Commission. And we are an independent, permanent commission of the New York State court system. Our mission is to eradicate systemic racism uh, and to achieve equality in the New York State court system. So back in 1989, 1991, the chief judge of the court at that time uh, asked uh, Ambassador Franklin H. Williams, who you, many of you may not know who Franklin H. Williams is. He was a civil rights attorney. He worked with Thurgood Marshall. Um, he was uh, one of the main uh, writers uh, of the brief for Brown versus the Board of Ed. Uh, and so he was a great figure. Uh, actually, the Williams Commission has a documentary that we uh, produced back in 2000, uh, 2021. Uh, which is on your public broadcasting stations. It is shown every Black History Month. Um, but anyhow, he was commissioned to write a, a report, and this was 1991. And what the report said, he spoke to its, uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, individuals who used the court system, et cetera. What the report said was that those courts used by individuals of color, housing, criminal, uh, and family court, uh, were termed ghetto courts. Okay, they had the, they received the least amount of resources. The, uh, the individuals working in the, those courts tended to be disrespectful. Uh, we had instances of court officers. We use court officers for our uh, law enforcement within the courthouse. The, uh, these individuals were disrespectful to the litigants. They called, believe it or not, this was 1989, they called the black uh, litigants, uh, black uh, defendants, pickaninnies. Really? Uh, they used the N-word quite frequently. They did this not only to the individuals coming into the courthouse, but also to their fellow uh, court officers of color. Uh, there was also statements made in terms of a black attorney or an attorney of color who would come into the courtroom. The court officers would never think that they were an attorney. <laughs> they would always think that they were a defendant or the mother of the defendant 
or you know, someone just coming into to the courthouse. And so the Williams Commission was formed. We were, as I said, our, our mission is to take a look at the New York State court system, figure out ways in which we can uh, increase in inclusiveness. Come to 2020, George Floyd is murdered. Uh, the now chief judge, or the chief judge at that time, commissions another report uh, by uh, then Secretary of State Jay Johnson, who was the f Secretary Jay Johnson, who was the Secretary, former Secretary of Homeland Security. He renders a report. Guess what? His report is almost identical to the report that was rendered in 1991. Same thing court officers being disrespectful. No resources for those courts that are used by individuals of color. And so what the Williams Commission attempts to do and what the New York State court system is now doing is attempting to impl implement measures that will increase uh, equity, uh, diversity, a systemic, uh, we have systemic racism. So what we have, we have now have anti-bias training, mandatory anti-bias training for everyone in the court system. Judges, everyone, clerks, everyone in the court system, mandatory anti-bias training. Um, so that's kind of basically what we do in New York. What that tells us is that we have to make sure that we are vigilant and we have to make sure that we continue to take a look at what's going on. Uh, because, you know, we're taking a couple of steps forward, but then we're taking multiple steps backwards. <clears throat> Thank you, Justice Weber. Uh, Judge Puig Lugo. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My good name morning. is Iram Puig Lugo. I am an associate judge with the Superior Court of the District of Columbia. I am originally from San Germán, Puerto Rico. And I left Puerto Rico when I was 18 years old. Uh, my task is to discuss the challenges and the barriers that we as Latinos face in terms of accessing equal justice. Now, before we get there, it's important to define Latino. What does it mean? Well, the Latino community consists of persons residing in the United States who have cultural or ancestral ties with Latin America. For some, um, either we or our ancestors came here. For others, we were here, and it was the border who crossed us. When Mexico lost 55% of its national territory to the United States at the end of the Mexican-American War. We are an incredibly rich and diverse community. We are of African, Native, European, Asian, Middle Eastern, and Jewish descent. We make up 19% of the U.S. population, one out of every five. Our presence in the U.S. has grown from 6. Point, from, sorry, from 9.6 million in 1970 to 62.5 million in 2021. And despite lingering stereotypes, 81% of us are US citizens. And 28 million of us almost half identify as multiracial. Mexicans are the largest group at 59.5% of the Latino population. Puerto Ricans follow at 9.3, Salvadorans at 4.0, Cubans and Dominicans at 3.8 each, Colombians at 2.2, Hondurans at 1.8, and then other countries follow after that. We're scattered throughout the country with the largest communities based in Texas, California, Florida, New York, and Arizona. And our English language proficiency can vary from 41.1% who speak English very well to 5.4% who do not speak it at all, which places about 55% of us between those two extremes. So why do I share this information? Because there can be significant differences within and between Latino communities across the country. Yet, we face similar challenges when it comes to access to equal justice. Let's take a look at those challenges. The first one is language. There must be competent interpretation services available for persons who have limited English speaking proficiency. The days of having English speaking youth serving as interpreters for their Spanish speaking elders are over. This means we must have in-house interpreters or set up systems to find interpreters when we need them. Now, two footnotes related to the issue of language. First, 
Don't use acronyms when you're speaking to another person through an interpreter. Acronyms do not translate. If you say PSI instead of pre-sentence investigation, the interpreter will simply say PSI, and the individual on the other side of the conversation will have no idea what you just said. Um, also, so keep in mind that the language issue also relates to sign languages. Mexican line la language, sign language is not the same as American sign language, and so on and so forth. This issue with languages carries over to court forms and informational materials. There is no right to counsel in the, in, in the U.S. for civil cases, for example. And as a result, many of the peoples that we see in our courthouses are representing themselves when it comes to family and civil matters. One of the things that we do is we give them informational materials explaining the law and court procedures. Those materials should be available in the different languages that we see in our communities. And the languages that I see in the District of Columbia are gonna be different than the languages that you might see in Provo, Utah. Now, um, the issue of languages also carries over in terms of notices, notices to appear, for example. It doesn't matter, you, you can give somebody a notice where the form language is in English, but if what the clerk hand uh, is in Spanish, I'm sorry, but if the clerk hand writes things in English, it'll distort the meaning. For example, if you set a hearing for July the 7th, um, and I'm sorry, for, let me put it this way, 7-8 is July 8th in English, 7-8, is August the 7th in Spanish. So that can generate a lot of confusion. Um, besides language, there's the issue of representation. When we walk into a courthouse, it is common that we do not see people like us working there. And that is a situation that crosses across uh, positions. So I see that my time is up. I will continue the conversation in the next round of questions. Appreciate you being here and your attention um, and willingness to engage with these topics. Thank you, Judge. Uh, <clears throat> because I'm keeping them to time, I have to keep myself to time. I, I was hoping they would actually go over. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't born Asian American. Um, I became Asian American when my family came to the United States when I was three in 1970. Uh, becoming Asian American is something that I am still becoming. You know, part of why I start there is that Asian American is an artificial category. But by saying that it's artificial doesn't mean that it's not real. So part of it is paying attention to how is it that Asian American has become constructed and uh, the ways that it impacts people who look like me. Um, and so when I think about uh, this, this category, Asian American, well, so one of the things is um, thinking about the way that uh, you have uh, the aggregation, like the lumping that occurs. So all that comes under the category Asian American, sometimes the broader category, AAPI, Pacific Islander. Uh, but you also have, have to pay attention to the things that are lost when you aggregate. So as an example, um, I was part of a task force on race in the criminal legal system in Washington State. And in our most recent report, we were able to disaggregate Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. And we noticed something that we had not noticed when we had done this 10 years before. And it was that when you're looking at police killings of civilians, uh, if you lump all Asian American and Pacific Islanders together in Washington State, it looks like People who look like me are killed by police less disproportionately than non-Hispanic white people, 0.33. But when you disaggregate, it turns out Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are killed at a rate of 3.6 times that of non-Hispanic white people. And it's also geographic, so that's part of what you also need to pay attention to. So uh, things that happen in, in the state of Washington are different from things that happen elsewhere. So think about how you know, aggregation occurs and how disaggregation occurs. Now part of aggregating was a political moment that took place in the 1960s. And so what happened was that a group of and, you know, Asian American activists decided, well, we need to work together to work in coalition if we're going to have a voice. 
And so they started actually following along with the black is beautiful, black power movement, and said yellow is beautiful and yellow power. But then there was this conference at UCLA called the Are You Yellow Conference? And Filipino Americans said, we're, we're brown, we're not yellow. And so then that's how the term Asian American actually came about. It was a political, it was a moment. Now, of course, even though you have that moment, once the category is created, there are all sorts of different forces that operate to create this. Now, in terms of what it is that possibly links together people who are incredibly diverse, it's the common experience with regard to different forms of discrimination. And so the, the most common one experience that people from Asia encountered was exclusion from uh, this nation's borders. And so through the operation of exclusionary immigration laws. And then it got carried forward when people who looked like me could not become naturalized as citizens, things that the U United States Supreme Court did in 1922 and 1923. So exclusion from our shores, exclusion from the national body. And then also you had very restrictive immigration quotas. And so uh, even when uh, people from Asian countries could immigrate, uh, the per country quota was often 100 per year. And you can imagine then when we think about this country, why it looks the way that it, it does, and this is something that I'll return to with question three, it's the residue of history. And so then when we think about how Europe, so in, in I just picked a year randomly, 1963, the continent quota for Europe was about 100,000 some odd per year. For Asia, it was 2,000 some per year. For Africa, it was about 1,000 some per year. And so this country looks the way that it does by design. Uh, and so with regard to people who look like me, we're often invisible, but then we're also sometimes hyper-visible. So paying attention to the way that that operates, the way that the perpetual foreigner stereotype operates. Uh, so the question, where are you from? Well, where are you really from? Like Ohio. And they're finally happy when I say Korea, and then they proceed to tell me about their trip to China. Um, <laughs> so, the other thing that operates with people who look like me, and that has to do with the changes to the immigration laws post-1965, is the model minority uh, myth, something that constructs us as the model minority, something that other minorities should strive to. We work hard. We've overcome discrimination. But it also doesn't recognize that people who came after post-1965 came with greater uh, cultural capital because we had to come in through the professional categories for immigration. And so uh, in the interest of keeping <laughs> with what I have asked my co-panelists to do, I will stop there and, and we will continue our discussion. Thank you. And so uh, we're going to go on now to question number two. Uh, and so what I asked the panelists to, to talk about is that with regard to different areas of law, specifically criminal law uh, and then civil slash family law, what are the key issues affecting access to justice, uh, including what might be done to address these access to justice issues? Uh, and then we're going to close with Justice Weber talking more about the New York example. So uh, I've asked Judge uh, Puig Lugo to begin, and so uh, he is addressing uh, that sub bullet point one. Thank you. Thank you. The reason he asked me to do this is because before I became a judge, I was a public defender in the District of Columbia for eight years and then worked three years as a criminal civil rights trial attorney uh, investigating and prosecutor matters related to human trafficking, um, police brutality, and hate crimes. So in, in terms of the um, criminal law, what are some of the things that we see as being barriers there? Um, before I wrestle with that topic, I just want to point out that when we talk about equal access, we often focus on the equal and we forget about the access because treating everybody equally often impedes access to the court system. We need to meet people where we find them and provide the interventions necessary so that the focus is on the access to make sure that the access is equal, not equal access. Now, um, one of the issues that we have uh, in criminal justice is that there are many uh, it starts with police community relations, right? 
What is the relationship between the police and the community? What is the communication like? What is the interaction? Is, is there a, a collective effort to improving things or are things antagonistic? I don't need to tell you what the history is. And you are the ones who know how things manifest in your particular communities. But if we're talking about access to justice, that's where it starts, in the streets. When people come into contact with the court system, what are the off-ramps? Because oftentimes we bring people into the system and just throw them into the deep end without exploring things like diversion, without exploring things like uh, deferred sentencing agreements, without exploring other interventions that I actually might help address both concerns about safety and rehabilitation. Because this whole thing about safety versus rehabilitation, that's a false choice. That's a false dichotomy. Each supports the other. And you cannot have safety without rehabilitation. Related to rehabilitation, one of the problems has to do with services. What services are available in terms of mental health services, substance abuse treatment? It's interesting to see the nation's reaction to the fentanyl crisis compared to the nation's reaction to the crack epidemic. Very different approaches. Why? What have we learned from it? Based on what we've learned, how can we do things differently? Um, in terms of once being in the courtroom, what does the courtroom look like? Do the courtrooms reflect the communities that they serve? Do the courthouses we serve the, uh, reflect the communities that they serve? If you're Latino, raise your hand. Is that one out of five? Not by far, okay? So the courthouses need to look the, like the communities that they serve, or at the very least be culturally competent and know what challenges different communities face as well as their needs. Legal representation. We don't have lawyers, we don't have judges who look like the communities that come into the courthouse. Um, and we know that situation will only get worse based on case law that came down from the Supreme Court recently. Um, juries, do juries reflect the people who are on trial? A jury of their peers, are our jurors really peers of the people who are coming through the court system. From which pockets of information is it that we're putting together jury lists to summon people to the courthouse? Now, how, how am I doing time? Uh, four minutes, so you got one minute I got left. one minute, okay. I wanted to beat him to the punch, okay, got that. <laughs> All right, so, um, you know, and, and there's so, also something to keep in mind in terms of what happens if a person is convicted. How are we going to engage with them? Because um, the services must be competent culturally and also as depending on the needs that people have. And these services are just not when they're community-based prior to trial, community-based if they're on probation, it also has to do with what happens at the institution. If you're just gonna warehouse somebody for five, 10 years, when they come out, they're gonna be worse than they were when they went in. Are we providing services in the institutions? I just wanna say one more thing. Whatever approaches we take within the criminal justice system need to be trauma-informed. And in that regard, I'd like to shout out to the uh, NCJ, FCJ, because we've done a lot of work on making sure that systems in the juvenile delinquency side of the conversation, as well as the child welfare system are trauma-informed, and those are concepts, ideas, and initiatives that would translate into the adult system. So if you're interested, check out our website, look at our resources, see what you can use in your particular jurisdiction. Thank you. So we're gonna have an opportunity now for uh, Justice Weber or Dean Warner to comment um, on, on, on this area. Okay, so uh, that's so much to unpack. I just wanted to say a couple of things in, in terms of New York. Um, I sit in the appellate division, as I said, we have a beautiful courtroom. And up above uh, where we sit, there's a dome. And on that dome, we have the names of various uh, Supreme Court justices and other justices. Two of the uh, justices' names up there were slaveholders major slaveholders. One of the justices um, wrote the uh, decision in, uh, in Plessy. Uh, 
So you can imagine how I feel, right? When I'm sitting there and I have the name of the slaveholders above my head. Something to think about. In New York, we do provide representation uh, for individuals in civil matters, uh, uh, indigent uh, representation, civil matters, including family court. Also, we do also do jury outreach, as was mentioned, so that our juries are uh, representative of the population. Uh, and I'm going to see the rest of my time. And I just want to build on this theme that we were talking about earlier about the importance of the criminal justice system looking like the community that it's serving. There's so much research that shows that to have effective criminal justice systems, you need to have community buy-in, which means that it needs to look like the community. And the reason why that's so incredibly important in Indian country um, is the fact that the current criminal jurisdictional maze, as we call it, is not representative of the community. And those who are enforcing laws in Indian country are oftentimes hours and hours away from the community that they're actually serving. Um, so the answers in terms of what are the problems is also what are the solutions. So I'll just briefly point on three areas of the law to give you an understanding of the scope of this problem. So first, there's the Major Crimes Act, which says that if you commit a major crime, and it's 14 enumerated crimes, things like homicide, things like uh, burglary with um, a weapon, then the federal government can prosecute you. And the impact of this is that even though it's concurrent jurisdiction with tribes, in the vast majority of these cases, the federal government is the primary one to enforce the laws. Oftentimes, the federal government is located hours and hours and hours away from these tribal communities. I always like to give the example of Montana, where Billings, Montana, is 10 hours away from Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes. Um, so you have this problem with access to justice. Similarly, under the Indian Civil Rights Act, sounds good, not so good in application. Um, specifically under the Indian Civil Rights Act, the United States Congress limited tribal enforcement authority to one year and or $5,000 fine. So this has had the impact of criminals literally targeting Indian country because one, they know the feds are far away, and two, even if they um, are captured and prosecuted, there's limitations on the tribal court's punishment authority. The third law that I'll briefly touch on that impacts criminal laws in Indian country is the Oliphant decision, also from 1978, a very busy year in Indian country. Um, and in that decision, the US Supreme Court held that the tribes have been implicitly divested of their criminal jurisdiction over non Indians. So again, if you're a criminal and you're kind of rolling around Oklahoma and you're trying to decide where you're going to commit your crime, and this actually happens, um, you're going to do it in Indian country because the tribes don't have jurisdiction over you and the feds are hours and hours away. Um, so the result of this is that many crimes go unprosecuted. Um, um, the tribal communities hate the federal government, hate many of the states, don't have any belief in the justice system, and these things continue to be perpetuated. So when we're talking about reform, we would have to work on some of these laws. Thank you. Uh, Judge Puig Lugo, do you want to just step back in for a moment about this topic, or? Sure. Any particular area you'd like me to look at? Oh, no, in? I just wanted to give you the opportunity as, as you open this. Um, we are cleaning up at this point the, mace, the mess that we made in the 1980s and the 1990s when we incarcerated people left and right. And we're coming back after the fact with these sentence modification schemes. I don't know whether you have managers have had to deal with implementing these pieces of legislation in your jurisdiction, um, but we really want to put ourselves in a position where we will not repeat that mistake where we will learn from the past. Um, and I think where I was le left things off had to do with the jury veneers and making sure that we had representative panels of jurors coming in. Look at the sources of look at the sources that you're getting for potential jurors. Don't keep it to driver's licenses. Don't keep it to just tax records. Consider things like public benefits. Consider things like people who have IDs who might not necessarily have a car, but try to be expansive in terms of who you bring into the courthouse to, to sit on jurors. Uh, 
Um, and that's all I can think about right now. Thank you. Uh, so uh, now, uh, Dean Warner. Yes. Um, so we've chatted about criminal law. Let's talk a little bit about civil law. And I'm gonna talk about two things. I'm gonna talk about how civil law in Indian country is different than anywhere else in the United States. Um, and that's kind of a central theme when we're talking about Indian country is things are just different than anywhere else in the United States. And then I wanna talk briefly about the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, it's actually not something that directly impacts Indian country because it applies to state courts, not to tribal courts. But a lot of you probably work with state courts and are therefore impacted by the Indian Child Welfare Act, so we'll talk briefly about that. So when we talk about tribal civil jurisdiction, it's strongest over tribal members on tribal territory involving matters central to tribal government. So things like property interests, oftentimes things like family law. Um, for other situations, so where you have non-Indians on non-Indian land, and remember there's a lot of non-Indian land in Indian country because of that allotment period in the 19th century when the federal government opened up reservations to non-Indian settlement. Tribes have, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, and you might notice whenever I say according to the U.S. Supreme Court, I don't necessarily agree with this, but it is the existing law. Um, so according to the U.S. Supreme Court in the early 1980s, the court found that tribes have been implicitly divested of their civil jurisdiction when Indians are on non-Indian land within the reservation. And this came up, um, to give you an example of the context, uh, the Crow tribe was trying to regulate its fisheries and there were non-Indians engaged in fishing on non-Indian land within the Crow Re Reservation. If you've seen a river runs through it, you know why it's a great place to go fishing. Um, and so the tribe was trying to regulate that fishery. And the court said the tribe could not do that. And that the tribe only had jurisdiction for that circumstance under one of two exceptions. Either the non-Indians agreed to the jurisdiction of the tribe, um, or where the impact of the non-Indians threatens the health, safety, or welfare of the tribe, which the court later explains means that it threatens the ability of the tribe to govern itself. Um, so this is a relatively high bar. The U.S. Supreme Court has not given us an example of this. Several of the um, circuit courts have, but things that threaten the health, like extensive pollution, for example, if you have a non-Indian actor in Indian country, um, engaging in extensive pollution, the tribe may have the ability to regulate and adjudicate in that instance. Um, so we can see how civil jurisdiction is gonna be very different as to whether or not tribal courts um, are gonna have jurisdiction in those instances. And then of course, if tribal courts don't have jurisdiction, then who does? And who's gonna bring those cases? And is there gonna be fair representation, especially in states where you have incredibly antagonistic relationships between the states and the tribes? I also want to briefly point on the Indian Child Welfare Act. That, of course, has been recently in the, U um, in the news. The U.S. Supreme Court upheld the Indian Child Welfare Act as constitutional in the latest challenge um, to that act. Uh, and it applies to state courts instead of tribal courts. So what happens in the Indian Child Welfare Act is if you have a tribe who's, or a child who's eligible for enrollment or who is a citizen of a tribe, then the state court must give notification to that tribe that the child is currently in the state court. Now the tribe has the option of doing one of two things, of either saying yes, we would, have, we would like to have jurisdiction over that child and that procedure, or no, we don't wanna have jurisdiction. And tribes are kind of all over the map and whether or not they'll assert jurisdiction. So for example, the Cherokee Nation, which is one of the largest tribes in terms of population in the United States, has a rule that it'll only assert jurisdiction um, in ICWA cases with in a 75 square mile radius. So it completely depends on the tribe and you'll get a different answer based on the trial that you're doing. And the Indian Child Welfare Act has been vilified in the mainstream public as preventing children from having good homes. But we have to put it into its historical context and understand why it was enacted to understand how it's related to justice. So it was enacted again in 1978, busy year in Indian country. Um, and prior to enactment of the Indian Child Welfare Act, 25 to 35% of native children across the country were taken by state or private adoption agencies into 
into um, custody outside of the home. And then 85% of those children were placed outside of native or kinship families. Um, even though oftentimes in those instances there were placements available. And so Congress determined when it passed the Indian Child Welfare Act that this was a plague upon Indian country. It was modern assimilation of taking native children out of their homes and placing them into non-native homes, and that the Indian Child Welfare Act was necessary to stop that. So it's really important to put the act into its historical perspective when oftentimes people get frustrated with the individual cases that they may be working on. It's really important um, to protect our native children and to maintain their connection to tribes. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, Judge Puig Lugo or Justice Weber, do you want to comment on this area of civil family law? Um, I'd just like to point out that at least as far as the Latino community is concerned, one of the issues that we have is trusting the institution. And people might be reticent to come into the courthouse if they don't trust you, if, you don't, if they don't feel welcomed in, in the courthouse. Um, and there's a tendency to stay away and family matters linger and, and situate domestic violence lingers. Um, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, also, please keep in mind that for many Latinos, not all, because I mentioned 81% of us are citizens, but for many people, they're dealing with immigration consequences. And part of the concerns in terms of approaching you might have to do with worries about what contact with us would mean for them in the immigration side of things. Um, so please keep that in mind. And just to tie things up in terms of the criminal law that I mentioned, um, immigration law keeps changing and a sentence that would not get somebody deported yesterday might get them deported today. So we need to be aware of what's happened on the immigration side of things to make sure that whatever we do will result in the outcome that we seek. Thank you. Uh, Justice Weber, tell us what New York is doing and, and what, 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 what we can learn. Oh, so New York is doing a lot, we're, we're, or at least we're trying to do a lot. And so what we do is we look at these issues, those that were mentioned by uh, Professor Lugo and, and others that are mentioned by the stakeholders, and, and we try to figure out a solution and we try to implement um, programs or what I have, or we'll deal with that. So perception, uh, when you, as stated, when you walk into a courtroom, you wanna see someone who looks like you. You also wanna feel a sense of respect. So um, we looked at uh, litigants, we did surveys, we uh, uh, looked at stakeholders, and we found that litigants believed, believe it or not, that judges were disrespectful uh, I, of course, didn't understand how this was possible, but they claimed, they claimed that certain judges were disrespectful and that judges tended to be, uh, uh, they would be loud, they would be shouting at the, the, the litigants. They also said that the courtroom personnel engaged in this behavior as well, which again, we know does not occur. So uh, believe it or not, in New York, what we did was we actually put forth a bill of rights uh, or what you can expect uh, when you go into a courthouse. What you can expect and, and what is expected of you. Uh, and, and so that's worked out pretty well. We also have posted um, uh, this, this, you know, what you can expect. And also if you have complaints, uh, we uh, have a, a way that you can, you know, do the cue card to, the cue to, uh, to register a complaint. But again, perception. So we attempt to increase the number of individuals of color uh, judges as well as court personnel. And we wanna make sure in terms of court personnel that the hiring, the retention, and the promotion process is fair and equal. Because I think some of you may know, and maybe this is endemic to New York, sometimes the fix is in. And you know, there's a promotion to a senior clerk position or a senior position, and it's kind of like, well, why should I apply when I know he's gonna get it, right? Because the chief whoever, uh, the chief administrator, uh, you know, likes him, uh, or he's his uh, cousin, and, and so therefore he's gonna get the job. <laughs> so I know it never happens in your states. I must admit it sometimes does happen in New York. 
So what we do is we make sure that the, uh, the uh, interview process is fair. We make sure that, that we do panels uh, for the interviews. We make sure that the panels are representative of individuals. And we make sure that as much as we can, we make sure that it's fair. We also look at the data to see who's applying and who's getting the position. In terms of who's applying, we do outreach to the community uh, to ensure that community members um, apply for those positions. Because if you're not in it, you can't win it, right? So we make sure that individuals apply. We have pipeline programs also in, to, in order to increase the diversity of judges. Because not only because of this recent Supreme Court decision, uh, but also in general, we saw that the numbers of individuals of color applying to law school, graduating from law school, becoming lawyers, and therefore becoming judges is decreasing. So we do outreach programs. We have pa uh, pipeline programs to uh, junior high school, high school, as well as college students. We also have programs where they come to the courthouse. And the Williams Commission has adopted schools. And so we'll work with those schools or work with those uh, students so that they see what, you know, what being a judge is all about, what being a, a, a lawyer is all about. We don't want an individual's first uh, uh, interaction with the court or with the courts to be negative. We want it to be as positive, if that's possible, as positive as possible. The pandemic has taught us a lot in terms of what we can do virtually. So family court, for example, and also criminal court. In New York, we would have a defendant coming in on a criminal case maybe once a month for no reason, really, to say that the case is being adjourned. So what we do now is we have virtual appearances. Uh, so you can appear virtually, you, you don't have to come to the courthouse. We do the same with family court. By definition, families, they may, you may have children, right? You can't bring, we do have uh, family care systems, uh, family care facilities at each courthouse. So at least we're trying to make sure that there's one at each courthouse. But you don't want to bring your child to the courthouse necessarily, right? So we do virtual appearances. Also jobs, right? You, you know, people have jobs. Uh, and so, you know, you, you don't want to lose your job because you have a court appearance. How am I doing on time? I'm giving you back the minute or two. Oh, OK, seated. thank you. I'll take it. I'll take it. So we have the pipeline programs. We try to do uh, alternative dispute resolution so that you don't have to go to family court if you have an issue. Uh, perhaps you can do uh, alternative, uh, alternative dispute. Outreach, community outreach is very, very important. Finally, training. Training, training, training. We put a large emphasis on training. I mentioned the anti-bias training, also just training in terms of how you deal with the public. Believe it or not, people have to be taught. Also in New York, and I think in other states, we have a major issue with mental illness. And so it's really important that you know how to deal with individuals who come into a courthouse who may have some type of mental illness. Lastly, uh, language access. We have a major program in New York in terms of uh, language access. I forget how many languages we have uh, of individuals who, who speak in New York. Uh, Queens alone, I think, has like over 100 different dialects and different languages. Uh, so, you know, we try to implement things that's going to improve, and we look to the members, uh, the stakeholders, and those who use the courts to try to figure out what we can do and how to make it better. Thank you. Uh, Dean Warner, uh, Judge Puig Lugo, uh, would you care to comment? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in the District of Columbia, we pretty much engage with the community and offer the uh, um, programs and supports that the justice just spoke about, except for one thing, we don't do nepotism. No nepotism <laughs> oh, oh, in the no. District of Columbia. <laughs> um, but we do have, the, the chief judge has convened a group that has carried out the type of investigation that has been conducted in New York. And we've brought everybody within the court into the conversation. It's just not the judges, it's just not the managers. It's judges, managers, staff. We survey court users, we keep data, we make sure that we identify needs and are proactive in terms of addressing them. And what the justice said in terms of um, going out into the community, that's key. People don't trust you if they don't know you. Uh, 
And one of the ways that they can get to know you is by you going out there, speaking in their schools, speaking in their churches, speaking in their community centers. So um, it's, it has to be a comprehensive approach, but it's doable. And you just do one thing at a time and eventually you'll get to the other side. Thank you. So question number three, uh, how does developing a deeper understanding of the barriers and challenges and how we got here help lead us to think about solutions to the equal access question? And so for this question, I'm going to speak for five minutes and then give an opportunity for the, my panelists uh, to comment. Um, and so this is a theme that actually has, has uh, sort of run through uh, each of the speakers. Uh, I, I think about this as uh, the pr problem or challenge of dealing with the residue of history. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Judge Puig Ligo talked about the 1980s and 1990s. Um, uh, Justice Weber talked about the composition of, of the courts and, and, and the names that appear on courtrooms, reaching back a little further in, into history. And Dean Warner has talked about um, conquest and dispossession. Uh, what do we do? How do we, how do we understand what history has produced? And then how do we then work uh, to change that? And so when I think about the residue of history, I think about the way that we are products of history. But I also want to, to not just um, be passive uh, or encourage you to think about this in a, in a passive kind of way, uh, but also to think about how we are agents. Uh, and so we have the capacity and power to act in the present. We have the capacity and power to impact the future. And so rather than throwing up our hands, because uh, a lot of times that, that's what I want to do when I, when I learn more, it's like you know, I, I learned even more from, from the panelists today, um, it can be immobilizing to feel like, wow, there is so much. Uh, what do we do about this so much? We can't do everything. And of course, we can't do everything, but you can do something. And so when you learn more about history and understand how we got here, um, it gives you the, the capacity the, to be able to recognize that when we think about um, the way that bias operates, uh, in the courtroom uh, and throughout our society, we can start to understand that it is the residue of history that leads us to, to have stereotypes about people and then to understand those things. And so uh, some of you may be familiar with the studies that were done uh, by economists uh, from the University of Chicago with regard to sending out resumes with black sounding names and white sounding names and the differences in terms of their treatment, who got callbacks. Uh, and we know from this, those, those studies that have been replicated, that people carry these stereotypes, these biases, these implicit biases. And the thing about these, these biases is not just that it's against people, certain people, but one of the most powerful insights from this research is the in-group favoritism that operates. That quite often, the differences in outcomes that we see, it's not because maybe somebody has ill feelings or bad feelings about a black person or somebody who's not like them, but rather they may favor people who look like themselves. And so understanding this, this is one of the, the deep residues of, of history that then gets carried forward. So then when we think about, well, if that operates in the, the context of, of resumes and, and jobs, well, how does that operate with regard to policing, those initial encounters? And then it gets carried forward. And so then when we also, I forgot to set my time, so. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Moderators, uh, this is, this is a, yeah. <laughs> took me 30 years to like, you know, like learn how to, like this, this trick. So tricks of the trade, right? And so, um, and I now have no idea what I was, was talking about. <laughs> um, So um, in terms of 
understanding and appreciating how the past has produced this present, uh, and then recognizing that this is not the present that we want. Uh, that, getting to that place, I think is critical to motivating us to working to make things different. And so uh, I'm going to assume that I am out of my time, which I probably <laughs> am, and invite my co-panelists to speak on uh, this point about history and what we might do about it. I'll make two points here. Um, the first is, I hope if you've taken away nothing else from my discussion, very brief discussion, um, of access to justice challenges in Indian country, it's that it'll help to personalize the person in front of you for all the reasons that Professor Chang just explained. So we're not impoverished because we don't want to work or because we're alcoholics. That's a common um, stereotype of us. I once was in a social setting with the father of a friend and the father was going on and on about how all natives are drunks and gamblers and we don't want to work and we're just all alcoholics. And finally, my husband got so frustrated. He said, well, you know Elizabeth is native, to which the father said, well, then you know. Right? And so I think we're going to double down on this stereotype. Um, also, why we as Indians might not feel comfortable in state or federal governments because of missing murder and indigenous women not being prosecuted, because of the long, horrible history with the federal government of removing our children, um, not prosecuting crimes, because of the lived and historical trauma that we have experienced. Um, and then secondly, I'm also hoping that if you take away nothing else, that you'll look to tribes as potential partners. So I mentioned earlier that I was a district judge for the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation, and we had an MOU with the local state uh, uh, courts in Kansas, which allowed for state courts to uh, turn over a case to us. And we had a healing to wellness court where we dealt with uh, folks who were struggling with addiction. And because we were able to help those individuals through a culturally appropriate way, we actually had a very um, successful system where we had 70% sobriety and non-recidivism, which uh, was much better than the state system. So we want to partner with you. We want to work collaboratively with you. Um, and so please look to us as partners as well. Thank you. Judge? Um, <clears throat> Just to follow up on what's been said, uh, developing a deeper understanding of the barriers and challenges and how we got here is just the first step. It means nothing if we don't move on to the next step and the step after that and the step that follows. But it's the necessary first step because we can learn from the past. Things don't happen in a vacuum. If we learn from the past, we're not going to repeat the mistakes that were made before. If we learn from the past, we can deal with the present to step into the future. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are different jurisdictions that do things in a different way and we can learn from each other. Um, that is really the only way that we're gonna move forward. We cannot continue to operate in isolation, whether it's within the courthouse, managers, um, judges, court staff, we have to work as teams because we collectively are the ones who are managing this system. And when we are managing this system, we need to make sure that whatever barriers and challenges have continued from the past until today are not going to continue forward into the future. So I agree with what everyone has said, however, if you don't know your history, you cannot learn from it. And that is my issue, I guess, right? Is that so many people either do not know their history or we have individuals and groups who are trying to change history and rewrite history. So it's, it's difficult. Definitely you have to know your history, but people don't know their history. They don't know that law enforcement kind of started because of the, uh, the uh, slave uh, troops, the, the vigilantes who were out to, to bring back the slaves. That's how we got law enforcement, okay? That's the impetus really of policing is because they had to find these runaway slaves and they bring them back and 
Now we have law enforcement. Now we have policing. People don't know that. There was a story recently in the news, I don't know if you saw this, where this guy wrote, I love Bridget or something like that on the Coliseum right, mm-hmm. in, uh, in Italy. And he said, geez, I, I didn't know the Coliseum was so old. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and I think he was serious, okay? Because he doesn't know history, right? He doesn't know about the Coliseum. He doesn't know about, you know, European history, et cetera. But, oh, I didn't know it was so old. It didn't look that old. Uh, they had, I think they were starting the renovation. But anyhow, you have to know your history. And once you know your history, I think then that will assist you in terms of the future. But, you know, we have to do more in terms of education, definitely. And we have to do more in terms of conversation and speaking about it. I now remember that point that I was... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so... A lot of times, you know, one of the things that, that is very popular right now is this idea of algorithmic tools uh, that might be used in, in court processes, especially with regard to um, pre, uh, pre-trial uh, bail, uh, uh, things like that. So, but when we think about algorithms, sometimes we forget that they operate not just from a vacuum, but they're produced because of this previous history. And so then when we think about the rise of pretrial risk assessment tools, we forget that in the 1920s that uh, risk assessment tools were created with regard to release that explicitly used race. And that these, like one of the more popular ones was not eliminated until the 1970s. And so when we think about the, then the construction of the sentencing guidelines, well, that also bakes into the system uh, the residue of the past. And so I just uh, encourage you to learn more about this before sort of leaping uncritically into thinking, well, we'll just let AI take care of this. Uh, garbage in, garbage out, the residue of, of history. And so um, we're going to go on now to our final lightning round. Uh, PowerPoint is great, right? It's like I did this, like, and then it suggested this as as as. as <laughs> slide background. And so uh, for takeaways, we're going to give each of the panelists an opportunity uh, to uh, give us takeaways. And so I'm going to start on the other side. So Justice Weber, and we're going to go this way. Okay, Lightning. So you have to know what the issues are. There has to be conversation. Um, This is so great because you meet other people, you have conversations, you figure out what we have to do. You have to be vigilant in, in making sure that, you know, you can whatever changes you're making, that they are working, and you have to revisit and make sure that, you know, everything is, is working the way you want it to work. But they're really, you, you really need the conversation, you really need the different input of ideas to see what can be done and, and how it can be done. Uh, two, two points. Um, the information that you have gathered here during the, the conference, when you go home, put it into practice. Um, how can you put it into practice? Second point. We need to have conversations, as Justice Weber mentioned, but that often requires engaging with stakeholders, not just within the courthouse, but outside the courthouse. Um, If if there's conversation to be had, make sure that child welfare is there, uh, juvenile delinquency uh, uh, probation officers are there, police officers are there, the schools are involved, mental health and substance abuse providers. If you uh, don't have a committee structure where you can already insert this conversation to occur, then create that separate working group but to the extent that you can use structures already in place to promote this dialogue, go there first. Um, One point, and then I'm gonna give you some resources that I hope are helpful, including my personal email address, so you can always reach out to me. The first point I wanna make is, I think a theme that you've heard today is non-majority folks not feeling safe in the court systems. So what can you do? And this goes back to Professor Chang's point earlier today. One thing you can absolutely do is slow down. 
All of the research shows that bias creeps in when we speed up and we try to get through things. When I was on the court, I would get made fun of because my arraignments took forever because I wanted to make sure that people really understood their rights. So if you slow down, that decreases the likelihood that bias will creep into your decisions and take the time to make sure that everyone understands. I think everybody's given a good example on the panel of places where we might assume understanding, but for various populations, understanding might not exist. Then the resources. So first, my email address, elizabeth.warner at law.utah.edu. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I also recommend to you the National Tribal Judiciary Center of the National Judicial College. So again, that's the National Tribal Judicial Center. They have resources for everyone involved in court systems, administrative personnel, and uh, judges alike. Also, your local law schools, most law schools schools nowadays have somebody who's teaching Indian law, so they can be resources to you. I also recommend the Turtle Talk blog, Turtle Talk blog, turtle as in the animal, talk as we talk blog. It's a great place to get up-to-date information on what's happening in Indian country. And last but certainly not least, I invite you to join the Federal Bar Association's Indian law section um, as they have uh, wonderful conferences and resources on these issues. So, um First, uh, learn your own history. Uh, second, learn the history of others. Uh, then it's on you um, in terms of uh, what you might do. So one of the things that I've learned in terms of the advocacy that I engage in, uh, trying to change legal doctrine um, through impact litigation, is that first, you have to get, and this is the audience that I'm talking about, our, our, our judges. Um, you have to get them to recognize uh, that there's a problem. So that's sort of internal, recognize. Uh, then you have to get them to acknowledge it. And so for me, that's a public acknowledgement uh, that there's a problem. Third, you have to get them to recognize that they have power in that space. Uh, because quite often what I've, I've noticed is that they'll say, they'll recognize there's a problem, they'll make a public announcement about, about it, but then they'll throw their hands up and say, well, but we can't do anything. And I just have to keep reminding them, well, you're judges, you have power. Um, once they recognize that they have power, uh, then the next step after that is getting the judges to act upon that power. Now, that's the audience of judges, but I think that applies with, with all of us to think about, to recognize, to acknowledge, state publicly, to then recognize the power that you have within the space, in, in the spaces in which you operate, and then to exercise that power. And so then I hope that when you learn your own history and learn the history of others, that then you'll see that you are able to act. So because the lightning round went so well, I'm gonna go back the other way, and, and each, of the, each of you will get to have uh, uh, some closing comments. Well, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I know, this is, this is uh, where you see uh, the real uh, genius of, 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 of the panelists. I, I, <laughs> No pressure. No pressure. Um, so in addition to what I've said and the resources that are out there to help you, I would also say don't be scared to wade in. Um, one of the most common comments I get as dean or as an administrator is that something happened, something bad happened, and then the person there said nothing. So a bad word was said or a stereotype was promoted, and for example, a faculty member said nothing. And remember, silence is affirmation. And oftentimes I talk to folks and they will say, well, I just don't wanna make it worse or I just don't know what to say. Um, and so therefore I said silence. And remember, you're conveying something with your silence. So it doesn't have to be a beautiful response, right? Sometimes we're just not in the moment prepared for something. But even if you say, uh, say what? Or huh? Or what was that? At least you've acknowledged, it's not articulate, right? But you've acknowledged <laughs> that something has happened and then whoever that is happening to feels at least seen. So whatever you do, in addition to slowing down and trying to acknowledge these histories, um, learning your history and trying not to promote the bias moving forward, 
don't be afraid to say something because so much happens through silence. And so please, please, please try to acknowledge what's happening in the moment, even if it's not the most articulately stated thing. I'd just like to reiterate, get out of the courthouse. Um, keep, a, keep your fingers on the pulse of what's happening in our communities. We need to do that so we can fashion our system in the way that makes more sense, that provides the greatest service possible. We are all public servants. I thank you for your commitment to working in your jurisdictions to make sure that the justice system is the best that it can be. But the bottom line is, if not us, who? We're the ones who are there. We're the ones who have to grapple with these issues. And when we grapple with these issues, we have to reach out to other sectors of society, to other professional groups, because that's the only way that we will be able to address those issues in a more comprehensive and thorough manner. So I wanna follow up with something that Professor Warner just said. One of the things that we have in New York and one of the things that we did as a result of these various reports is that we beefed up our Inspector General's office and we have an ombudsman, uh, ombudswoman uh, who deals with complaints. And these complaints are, you can make a complaint as to sexual harassment or if you see other employees who are engaging in uh, inappropriate behavior, it is done anonymously. Uh, to the Inspector General's office, and the Inspector General uh, will, will follow up on it. We had an incident in New York in family court where a family court clerk had a hot mic, and she uh, used the N-word uh, in terms of a young child. Not only did she use the N-word in English, she used it in Italian as well, which was like so strange. Uh, but anyhow, so she used the N-word in referring to this 14-year-old uh, because his pants were dropping or whatever. And folks complained. Right, and as a result of this, uh, she was terminated. Uh, so it, again, it's, and this was in 2021, right? Um, so again, it's important that you see something. You know, you there has to be a, a, a mechanism to complain, and I think you know all court, courts should have something like that. And so uh, I want to thank NACM for giving us the opportunity to engage with you. Uh, and I also want to thank all of you for uh, listening to us. Um, I hope that uh, you'll join me in, in thanking our, our panelists here. So thank you.